Today we will visit Ireland, the country known as the Emerald Isle. Ireland is located in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. It is known for its stunning scenery, rich history, and friendly people. The country has a rich cultural heritage and traditional music, dance, literature, and art form a large part of its identity. Overall, it is a vibrant and welcoming country with a unique culture and history, making it a popular destination for tourists and a great place to live. But in our story, the protagonist was not lucky enough to meet with friendliness, and the hospitality of her native country played a fatal role in her fate. On January 12, 2022, Ashley Murphy finished her schoolwork. She drove her red car off the grounds and into the parking lot, near the shore of the Grand Canal in Tallamore County, Offaly. She left the parking lot on foot, wearing a dark blue sports jacket, dark blue leggings, a white t-shirt, a gray scarf, blue sneakers, and a pink wool cat with a brown pom-pom. She was wearing an engagement ring and a gold necklace with the name Ashley on it, and a smart watch with an activity tracker connected to her smartphone. On the path to the bridge, Ashley met a girl who was walking with a dog. The dog ran up to Ashley. She petted him, and they exchanged a few words with the dog's owner. Ashley was watching her health and liked to walk briskly in the fresh air. She had walked about two miles and was on her way back to the parking lot when, from behind, a strong hand grabbed her neck in a strangling motion and dragged her into a ditch. The canal bank in Cappencourt, known as Fiona's Way, was popular with joggers and hikers. Two female friends exercising by the canal witnessed the attack. They noticed a mountain bike in the hedge next to the towpath and heard a loud rustling in the ditch below it. Believing someone may have fallen off the bike, one of them shouted, Are you okay? Do you need help? The second girl stepped off the sidewalk and peered over the hedge into the ditch. She noticed a man leaning over the woman and holding her by the throat. They saw the legs of the woman lying there, twitching vigorously like scissors. Fear and terror seized the girls. They screamed in the hope of frightening the man, but the screams did not frighten him, but only made him angry. He roared at them like a wild wolf. The girls roused themselves and hurried to get help. At Digby Bridge, they encountered two male cyclists and two waterway workers, the cyclists rode up to the scene of the attack and found the still body of a tortured girl in a ditch, her face covered with hair sticky with blood. One of the cyclists who discovered the girl's body called emergency services. Two police officers arrived on the scene ten minutes later. The boy indicated the girl's location in the ditch. The police unzipped her jacket and began attempts to resuscitate her, taking turns doing chest compressions. Paramedics arrived in conjunction with police officers and pulled Ashley Murphy, who was still alive, from the ditch and actively continued to resuscitate her. There were numerous open wounds on the right side of her neck. The EMT desperately tried to save the girl by attempting to use a defibrillator, but the monitor showed that she was no longer showing signs of life. The doctor stopped resuscitation efforts and covered her body with a blanket. A smartphone removed from her pocket showed the time as 4.15 in the afternoon. The GPS tracker handed over to police showed the exact geolocation and time of the incident. The recovered data revealed that she started walking at 2.51 p.m. and headed west along the bridge before continuing east along the canal towards Digby Bridge. She was last caught on CCTV at 2.55 p.m. After walking about two miles, she crossed Digby Bridge at 3.16 in the afternoon and then headed west back towards the parking lot. Five minutes later, at 3.21 in the afternoon, her activity tracker recorded erratic fluctuations consistent with a violent attack. Her heart rate was rapidly decreasing. The last heartbeat was recorded at 3.31 of the day. The crime scene was cordoned off. The body of the murdered woman was taken for forensic examination. An investigation was launched into the brutal attack that took the life of a young woman. All possible specialized units were involved in the search for the perpetrator. CCTV footage was reviewed and witnesses were interviewed. The victim was a young 23-year-old elementary school teacher who did not return home after school. Ashley Murphy was born July 6, 1998, in Blue Ball near Tallamore. Ashley Murphy was the youngest child of Raymond and Kathleen Murphy. She had a brother, Cathal, and a sister, Amy. She attended Tallamore Catholic High School for girls from 2011 to 2017. 
She then attended Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, graduating in October 2021 with a Bachelor of Education in Elementary Education. In March 2021, she started work at Darrow National School as a deputy teacher. She secured a permanent position at the school beginning in September 2021, where she taught first grade students until the day of her death. Murphy's family was a talented one. Both parents played traditional Irish music. Ashley played the fiddle from childhood, began mastering the Lancer's whistle and performed around the country with the National Orchestra. She also participated in traditional music festivals. At the time of her death, she and her partner Ryan Casey had been in a relationship for over five years and were planning to marry. Cathal Murphy arrived at the morgue and identified the dead, tortured girl as his sister Ashley. State pathologist Dr. Sally Ann Collis determined that Murphy had been stabbed 11 times in the right side of her neck, which severed her carotid artery and jugular vein and damaged both sides of her vocal cords, rendering her unable to call for help. She died from acute blood loss caused by the severe injuries. As a result of an active search for the perpetrator, police apprehended a 40-year-old man within two hours of the incident based on descriptions given by eyewitnesses, but released him the next day and eliminated him from the investigation. The professionalism and observation of the investigators and the will of chance helped to quickly get the events of that day piece by piece and fully assemble them like a jigsaw puzzle into a single picture. So on January 13th, emergency services received a call about a stabbing. Police and paramedics who arrived at the call noticed three stab wounds in the abdomen of the victim, which were not fresh and did not bleed. There were also numerous scratches on the man's face and hands. The victim of the fight was Yosef Puska. Investigator Gardai, during his interrogation at the hospital, considered him as a potential victim of the incident. According to Yosef Puska, he was attacked by two men, stating that one of them threw him to the ground and held him down while the other stabbed him. He also claimed that the scratches on his face, head and hands were caused by being dragged on the ground during the attack. However, Gardai suggested that the scratches that were recorded on Yosef's body as a result of the dragging were more consistent with scratches from the dense briar thickets. By obtaining CCTV footage, it was possible to refute Yosef Pushka's account of his displacement on the day of the attack on the teacher. Suspecting a connection to the Murphy murder investigation, detectives contacted colleagues in Talamore. A team of investigators led by Gardai devised a plan to obtain a confession about the January 12th incident in Grand Canal. Two detectives staged an interrogation of Yosef Pushka, pretending to believe his story about being attacked by two men. Yosef Pushka changed his testimony several times and was confused about time periods. So when questioned, he lost his alibi. With the help of a Slovakian interpreter, investigators said he had been identified by a witness and CCTV cameras recorded him at the scene during the attack on teacher Ashley Murphy. Under pressure, Puska confessed to the crime. At the inquest, the admission that he slashed Murphy's neck revealed details of her death that have not yet been made public. Pushka also admitted that he stabbed himself in the abdomen to throw the investigation off track. On January 18th, Pushka was released from the hospital and immediately arrested. Garde took him to the police station where his fingerprints, DNA, and blood samples were taken. After Pushka was charged with Ashley Murphy's crime on January 19th, he was publicly identified as 31-year-old Joseph Pushke. In 2013, Puskai moved to Ireland with his wife and two children. Puskai and his wife initially lived in North Dublin before moving to Tallamore in 2015. They had three other children in Ireland. He was unemployed and receiving Social Security disability benefits. Neither he nor his wife could drive, and he usually traveled by cab, bus, or bicycle. Puska had no previous convictions for violent crimes, although he had been involved in two other attacks on women, one in Prague and the other in the UK. As a minor, he was convicted of consensual intimacy with a girl under 15 in Slovakia. He did not know Ashley Murphy before the attack and had no known motive for the crime. Investigators also found that Joseph had become very active on dating apps in the weeks before the crime and had been in contact with eight Irish women. Gardy suggested that he may have attacked Ashley Murphy with intimate intentions and took her life after she fought back. 
On the day of Joseph's arrest, Ashling Murphy's funeral was held. Her funeral mass was held on January 18, 2022 at St. Bridget's Church, County Offaly. Among those present were the President of Ireland, the Prime Minister, the Minister for Justice, and the Minister for Education. Ashley's former pupils from Darrow National School lined up in a guard of honor outside the church, each holding a picture of her and a red rose. Schools and colleges across the country observed a minute's silence in her memory at 11 a.m. Her sister, Amy, described Ashley as the light of our lives and the heart of the family. Her lover, Ryan Casey, said, She was my soulmate. She is my soulmate. She will always be my soulmate. She is the greatest love of my life. Aisling Murphy was buried in the Lower Town Cemetery. Joseph Kamen's trial was scheduled for June 6, 2023. The trial was postponed because the prosecution needed additional time to respond to the defense's expert report. The trial began on October 17, 2023, before a jury of nine men and three women presided over by Mr. Justice Tony Hunt. At trial, Pushka pleaded not guilty to the murder of Isling Murphy. During the trial, the jury heard evidence seized from CCTV and geolocation of Ashley and Pushka's movements on the fateful day. The court heard testimony from several eyewitnesses and was able to establish that Cameron confessed to the crime two days after Murphy's death. Forensic evidence was also heard in relation to DNA and fingerprints. The jury was told that Pushka's DNA matched DNA taken from the handlebars of a mountain bike found at the crime scene, while his fingerprints were found on the seat of the bike. In addition, Cannon's DNA matched one time out of 14,000 with male DNA found under Murphy's fingernails after she tried to fight off her killer. The prosecution argued that the evidence obtained against Cannon was more than enough to prove and convict. Joseph Cannon's defense argued that in this case, he was an innocent victim who was stabbed three times by Ashley's attacker and he was trying to protect her. Joseph presented to the court how an unknown man wearing a surgical mask stabbed him three times in the stomach before killing Ashley Murphy. He claimed he tried to help Murphy deal with her injuries, but then left the scene because he was too scared. He claimed he had no memory of confessing to the crime. The defense argued that Pushke confessed while under the influence of medication following surgery, a surgery that a medical expert testified could have influenced his confession. However, an expert pharmacologist, Professor Michael Ryan, refuted this claim, saying that it is impossible for someone to confess to a crime after a small amount of medication. In addition, Pushka has previously given several different accounts of the events of January 12th and has already admitted that he lied to Gardai on several occasions, including when he claimed he was stabbed in a fight. On November 9th, 2023, after a trial that lasted more than three weeks, the jury deliberated for only two hours before reaching a unanimous verdict of guilty for suspect Yosef Puska. The judge said he was pleased that the jury would not spend any more time considering the nonsense that Pushka put forward in his defense. He said there would be a day of reckoning for Joseph and said, there is evil in this chamber. There is no doubt about it. The jury heard he stabbed Ashley Murphy several times in the neck, causing her to die from acute blood loss. Joseph Puskai, an immigrant from Slovakia, was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 12 years. Murphy's mother held up a photo of her daughter in court during the judge's comments. Murphy's friends and family applauded as the jury left the box. Speaking outside the court after the verdict was announced, Murphy's brother Cathal thanked the jury for their patience and fortitude throughout this incredibly difficult trial. He said his sister had been subjected to unfathomable abuse and stated, The trial cannot bring back our dear Ashley and cannot heal our wounds. But we are relieved that this verdict does justice. It is simply imperative that this vicious monster never be able to harm another woman again. In June 2023, the Slovakian nationals, Cannon's wife, as well as two of his brothers and their wives, were arrested and charged with withholding information related to the Ashley Murphy investigation. All five were placed under arrest in December 2023. Their trials are scheduled to begin in April 2025. In January 2023, the Murphy family established the Ashley Murphy Memorial Fund to support traditional Irish arts, culture, 
and heritage for young people. Mary Immaculate College and the Irish National Teachers Organization have jointly established the Ashley Murphy Memorial Entrance Scholarship, awarded annually to a first-year undergraduate student who demonstrates exceptional achievement and talent in the field of traditional Irish music. Comhaltas Chaltuari Arian established three scholarships in her memory, one to support artists working in the traditional arts, one to support music education for young people, and one to support research into Irish traditional arts. People across Ireland have expressed shock and sadness at the death of teacher Ashley Murphy. The president of Ireland expressed his deep sympathy, grief, and sense of loss, and paid tribute to her short but brilliant and generous life. The crime has intensified the debate about the safety of Irish women, many of whom have shared their experiences of gender-based violence not only on social media, but also at ongoing meetings. At one of Ashley's memorial rallies, a female officer involved in the search for the perpetrator read a victim impact statement from Ashley Murphy's mother, Kathleen Murphy, which read, As a parent, you want your child to enter this world and live a full and meaningful life, while being acutely aware of how fragile their safety is, wanting to protect them. I failed to protect my darling Ashley, and now she is gone forever. The statement called Cannon an evil monster and said he should never see the light of day again. Ashley Murphy's fiancé, Ryan Casey, has recalled how they met at a local disco at the age of 15. He described how they planned to get married, build a house together, and start a family. Turning to Cannon, he said, Because of you, I lost my Ashley. I lost everything I ever wanted in life. I will never marry my soulmate again and see her smile. He also told Pushka, You smirked, you smiled, and you showed no remorse throughout this whole trial. That makes you the epitome of pure evil. You will never hurt a woman again. Amazingly in this story, the bestial cruelty displayed rallied an entire nation and drew a line in the treatment of women based on gender. What can we learn from the Irish after this story? Most likely their solidarity response to the national catastrophe that is any femicide, the participation in the movement against femicide of the highest level politicians and the most prominent cultural figures, and the concern of the common man, because anyone can become a victim and it is in everyone's interest not to let it happen. She just went for a walk along a familiar route she knew very well and always can't act, but not this time. August 12th, 2019 started out completely normal. Teacher's assistant Lindsay Burbeck was on vacation and she planned to spend the day with her family. She and her daughter Sarah shopping in Blackburn in the afternoon, and then they agreed to have a nice family evening over a cup of tea and meet her daughter's Duman boyfriend. They said goodbye, and Lindsay returned home to change and go for her daily walk to the woods. Around four o'clock in the afternoon, she left the house and never came back. To delve into this sudden disappearance and try to figure out why this particular day tragedy happened and who is to blame. The events are set in the town of Blackbourne in the county of Lancashire in northwest England. The town is located in the southern part of the county on the Blackburn River by the Leeds Liverpool Canal at the junction of four roads and near rich coal mines. Blackburn is renowned for its natural environment and has four huge wooded parks. Lindsay separated from her husband Tim Burbeck in July 2018 but they continued to live together in Captain until March 2019. She then moved to her new home on Burnley Road in Hancote. Lindsay kicked her for her two adult children, Duven, 20, and Sarah, 17. She worked as an upper-grade teacher's aide at Acton Hill Elementary School in Burnley and loved being surrounded by children. Lindsay was a talented artist who could go the extra mile to create the most amazing props for school productions and plays. On the fateful day of August 12th, she went for a walk in a wooded area known as Coppice near her home in the village of Hancote on the outskirts of Accrington and disappeared. At the appointed time, Sarah and her boyfriend Brandon arrived at Lindsay's home, but no one answered the door. Sarah became worried 
as it was out of character for her mother to forget a scheduled tea party. She tried several times to contact Lindsay, but no one answered the phone. Sarah then sent her a text message that read, Where are you? We sat outside for an hour and called six times. After receiving no response, Sarah sent another text message with a series of question marks, but again received no response. After waiting outside Lindsay's house for an hour, Sarah called her father, Tim Burbeck, to let him know her mom wasn't home and wasn't answering her phone. Tim took a frightened Sarah and Brandon back to his house. Near midnight, Sarah and Tim headed to Lindsay's house again, but with a set of spare keys. To their dismay, she never showed up. Inside, the house seemed quite ordinary and showed no signs of any incident. There was no note of explanation either. At 12.11 a.m. on the night of August 13th, Tim Burbeck contacted police and told the dispatcher, My ex-wife seems to be missing. We can't find her. It doesn't look like her. Lindsay Burbeck was reported missing. Lindsay's disappearance shook up the community. The people of the small suburb banded together and went out in search of the woman. There were hundreds of people, men and women, grandparents and people walking dogs, teenagers with bicycles and even moms with strollers. To most, Lindsay was a stranger. But that didn't matter. After days of desperate searches, social media appeals and posters, people still gathered at Coppice for two consecutive days in the hope of finding a vital clue that could solve the mystery of Lindsay Burbeck's disappearance. After several days of fruitless searching, it was clear to everyone that the search was going to be difficult. With each passing day, the chances of finding Lindsay alive dwindled. Detectives classified Lindsay Burbeck as high risk. She had never gone missing before, and her family described the disappearance as very uncharacteristic of her. Nevertheless, the search did not stop for a moment. Locals printed thousands of posters to distribute throughout the neighborhood, while a Facebook group associated with the search quickly grew to 10,000 members. A few hours after the police appeal was posted online, the first posters with Lindsay's face on them could be seen all over the neighborhood. Within a couple of days, there wasn't a lamppost, storefront, or traffic light that didn't have a poster calling for the search for Lindsay. Police launched an investigation into the disappearance from the house as extensive searches were carried out by specialist police officers, dog handlers, Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service, Mountain Rescue Volunteers, and the city's search and rescue team. Drones and helicopters were also deployed to search the area covering coppice and the surrounding open countryside for a considerable distance, including popular walking and running routes. Four days after Lindsay's disappearance, Lancashire police released CCTV footage showing when she was last seen alive. Walking along Burnley Road at 4.10 in the afternoon towards coppice, she was wearing a purple jacket black leggings, and dark sneakers with white soles. A week had passed since her disappearance on August 19th, and with each passing day, there was less and less hope of finding Lindsay Burbeck alive. Police are still no closer to the whereabouts of the mother of two, but emphasize that there was no evidence that she was the victim of a criminal act, meaning there was still a chance of finding her alive. The search for Lindsay continued. That evening, Hundreds of local residents took part in the first mass public search of coppice after a rallying call was made on social media. Things moved when a local resident's dog ran into a wooded area in Accrington Cemetery. He yelled and called her name several times, but the dog didn't respond. The dog hit its head in the bushes, sniffing and trying to dig for something. The dog's owner walked over to him, stood next to him and was horrified to find that there was something very soft under his feet. He was frightened and bounced back. Then he smelled a horrible odor and flies were swirling around. A plastic bag and something that looked like a foot were visible from the ground. On August 24th, 12 days after Lindsay Burbeck disappeared, her body was found under the most horrific circumstances buried in a cemetery. The naked body, wrapped in two clear plastic bags, mixed with earth and grass, was placed across a shallow grave. 
The search for Lindy Burbeck was considered complete. A murder investigation was officially launched. Pathologist Dr. Naomi Carter, after conducting an autopsy, determined that death was due to a broken neck. The trauma was inflicted with such force that the entire larynx had crushing injuries. The neck was most likely struck with a foot or knee. An attempt to cut off Lindsay's right leg after death was also determined, possibly with a saw, as tine marks were found. A large laceration was found on the leg, which had been cut down to the bone. The injuries Lindsay suffered were catastrophic. Dr. Carter also reported that due to the poor condition of the body, it was quite difficult to determine the victim's injuries. But she did not rule out any sexual activity on the day of her disappearance, which could not be ascertained due to the level of decomposition of the body. Prior to the discovery of Lindsay's body, members of the public and police had searched the same area for several days without success. Community volunteers and a police dog handler reported seeing a blue wheelie garbage can abandoned in bushes nearby. However, at this stage of the investigation, no one was yet aware of the significance of the tank. Volunteers who searched the cemetery at 9 p.m. August 20th also found the same dumpster with a dark stain on the outside and thought it might be blood. After taking pictures of the dumpster, they called the police. Two police officers arrived on the scene to inspect it and found a brown mark that they thought was dirt. The police said the dumpster looked brand new and there was no evidence at the time to link it to Lindsay's disappearance. Therefore, it was left in place. There were other important clues found in the cemetery that were not immediately accepted. For example, local resident Christine Alderson discovered a bloody cloth on the grass of the cemetery on August 18th while she and her daughter were walking their dogs. She said the blood on the cloth was fresh and red, but thought it might have belonged to a homeless man who frequented the area. Another woman who walks dogs, Judith Bibby, reported seeing red clothing hanging on a barbed wire fence near the Cargill Hill Trail that was probably Lindsay's jacket. She also heard a voice, presumably a child's, but heard no struggle, yelling or screaming. On August 25th, Investigators revisited the crime scene and found a yellow-handled saw and a pair of green, heavy-duty gloves near Lindsay's grave that had several traces of blood. The evidence was taken to forensic testing, and it came back positive. The gloves contained the perpetrator's DNA on the inside surfaces, and Lindsay's DNA was found on the outside surface of the left glove. A pair of her Skechers sneakers, which had been cut along the sole, were also found in a blue plastic bag discarded in the cemetery. Examination of other evidence revealed that Lindsay's body was wrapped in some kind of plastic sheeting, and between the body and the sheeting was found foliage and grass that was not in the cemetery grounds. This led investigators to believe that the body had been moved from another location. That's when detectives remembered a blue trash can that had repeatedly caught the attention of volunteers. Police officers studying the CCTV footage soon made a startling discovery that left the investigation team baffled. Several images showed a young man pulling a blue wheelie garbage can in the Burley Road area. Over the next few days, a CCTV camera captured a certain guy returning to the cemetery four times. Thanks to that footage, a suspect emerged. The video of a young guy carrying a trash can down the street, possibly with Lindsay's body, became a sensation. The video was shown on the news with a plea for help identifying the man. And it worked. The boy was identified by shocked teachers and parents. The team surrendered to police the same day. His name was withheld until sentencing due to his age. He was only 16 years old at the time of the crime. The boy in the videotape turned out to be local resident Rocky Marciano Price. Rocky Marciano Price lived with his parents and five siblings on Winnie Hill Road in Accrington. It had been the Price family home for about three decades. The young lad had an impressive array of mental health abnormalities. Rocky had suffered from autism, attention deficit disorder, and hyperactivity since childhood. His low IQ created additional learning and communication challenges. He attended an alternative school in Barnoldswick several days a week and was described by teachers as a very quiet and non-speaking student. In 2015, a psychologist assessed Price as having a limited understanding of his own emotions 
and his own emotional well-being. He had pronounced impairments in understanding the connections between events and emotions. Another 2016 report described Price as unresponsive to strangers and in constant need of supervision and care. Timothy Bradley, who taught at the school for 18 months, said they were always looking for ways to involve him in education, but Price preferred practical things to academic subjects. Price hardly ever engaged in conversation, even when it came to a topic that interested him. Teachers described Rocky Price as quite strong physically and tough for his age. He went to the gym regularly, liked to tend to the chickens on the family farm, and loved watching movies and playing Xbox. The guy lived in his own world and wasn't always aware of his actions. So what drove him to attack Lindsay Burbeck? Nothing at all. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time when Rocky Price was hunting lonely women. He was looking for a woman to kill, and he didn't care who it was. This was a completely random murder at the hands of a stranger. On August 12, 2020, exactly one year after the crime, Price finally stood trial. Rocky Marciano Price was unanimously found guilty by a jury after an eight-day retrial and four hours of deliberation. Appearing via video link from Her Majesty's prison Weatherby, Price 17, did not react in any way when the judge read out the verdict. There was also no reaction from his parents in court. He pleaded guilty to helping dispose of Lindsay's body, but claimed he played no part in her death. Rocky Price claimed he was approached by a male stranger and asked to assist in the burial of the woman for a fee. In a prepared statement, he admitted moving the garbage can and burying the body, but said he had no involvement in Lindsay's death. However, a search of his home in Accrington revealed plastic bags that were identical to those at Lindsay's grave. A tracksuit and other clothing was also analyzed and matched the one he was wearing on surveillance cameras on August 12, 16, and 17. Defense attorney Mark Fenhalls told jurors that Price did a horrible and heinous act by burying the woman's body in the cemetery, but he was not her killer. Despite the abundance of evidence against him, Rocky Price pleaded not guilty to the crime, but admitted to moving Lindsay's body. After two days of questioning, Price, through his attorney, prepared a statement to explain his movements between coppice, where police believe Lindsay was killed, and the cemetery where her body was found. But the prosecutor affirmatively stated that Rocky Price acted completely alone. The motive for the random attack on the 47-year-old mother of two was never revealed, as the perpetrator did not even know the victim. The judge sentenced Price to life in prison with a minimum term of 16 years. He will only be released when the parole board decides he is not a danger. The judge said the attack was swift and brutal. There was no doubt the defendant sprung with the intent to kill a woman who was walking by. Just minutes before Lindsay's incident, Zoe Braithwaite had managed to get away from a hooded teenager with her hands in her pockets, walking alone on a parallel path. Her sixth sense kicked in, and the woman was instantly wary. Zoe was confused by the guy's appearance. He looked out of place for a walk in the woods for this time of year. She quickened her step and then ran away. That probably saved the woman. If it hadn't been her, it could have been someone else. And it was Lindsay. This was a premeditated attack. After missing one woman, he didn't back off his plan to attack another lone woman. His actions after the crime clearly showed that he had the ability to plan and reason. His teachers told the court that he was much better at practical tasks than academic subjects. He used this ability to hide his body. Rocky Price was found to have made two return trips to Coppice on the evening of August 12th. The first incident occurred at 6.55 p.m. when he was seen on CCTV cameras carrying a black rucksack. Possibly in it, he was carrying a found saw to dismember Lindsay's body. The next incident occurred at 8.28 p.m. when dog walker Anthony Dewhurst was seen pulling out an already empty garbage can. This is the same spot where his grandfather, who bears his name, and other family members are buried. Without panic or excitement, young Rocky Price, acting alone, 
set in motion a plan to dispose of Lindsay's body by placing it in a blue garbage can like a piece of trash, and then burying it in a shallow grave in Accrington Cemetery, wrapped in two plastic bags. He set in motion a plan to dispose of Lindsay's body by first hiding her in a blue wheelie garbage can and then dragging her to the cemetery. Finding a quiet and secluded spot near the railroad line, he spent over an hour burying her body before leaving a saw, gloves, and a trash can at the scene. The murder of a stranger in broad daylight, for which there is no rational explanation, is particularly horrifying to all right-thinking members of society. The random nature of the attack suggests that the accused poses a very real danger to members of the public. The stalking of another woman before he killed Lindsay Burbeck demonstrates that his crime was not caused by a sudden loss of control. 24 hours after he was found guilty of the crime, publication restrictions were finally lifted by a judge, allowing his name and picture to be made public for the first time. Rocky Marciano Price's identity was kept secret during the first and second trial. The jury was told many important details about Price, but they could not be fully disclosed because of his young age. The judge rescinded the disclosure of the restrictions after the jury unanimously found Price guilty of the crime. The defendant's mental illness cannot in any way excuse or even explain his actions. After all, it is quite obvious that he realized that it was terribly wrong to kill, but did it anyway. Although fortunately such crimes are rare, they instill fear in society. However, the main question in this case remains unanswered. Why did the young guy needed to kill a strange woman, and for what? Only Rocky Price knows the answer. But he didn't answer it. Perhaps if it wasn't Lindsay Burbeck, it could have been someone else. Lindsay's funeral was held at St. Margaret's Church in Hapton on September 20th. More than 200 mourners gathered at the church as police stopped traffic on Manchester Road, while Lindsay's coffin with her body covered in flowers was carried into the church. Dozens of flowers from friends and family, and from strangers whose hearts were touched by Lindsay's story, were left at the scene. Sarah described her mom as a very optimistic and positive woman, Lindsay was making plans for the future. She was planning a trip to Glasgow with her friend Sharon. She dreamed of finding love on the Match.com dating site. Lindsay Burbeck planned a long and happy life for herself and looked forward to the future with optimism. But all those dreams were interrupted one sunny summer day. Lindsay Burbeck's family and the detectives who investigated the crime welcomed the jury's unanimous verdict but said no court verdict could ever bring Lindsay back or spare her family and loved ones the grief of loss. In front of the courthouse after the verdict was announced, members of the defendant's family wore T-shirts that read, Wrongfully Convicted, Set This Boy Free. The back of the T-shirts read, The Killer Is Still at Large. Maybe Price is an aspiring maniac. He just wanted to take a man's life, to feel what it's like, to watch someone die and mutilate them. Most likely in any form, it's an absolute neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by problems with social interaction, motor, and behavioral stereotypes. In translation, the word autism means a person who has gone into himself or a person within himself. Autism is still an understudied developmental disorder that can occur due to genetic or hereditary abnormalities. The exact cause is not fully understood, but in our story, the punishment most likely fits the crime. The angry man walked out of the house slamming the door hard. He reached the driveway and stopped. He ran his hand through his black, disheveled hair several times. The man was visibly nervous and said something quietly under his breath, then walked briskly back toward the house. He tugged sharply on the doorknob and stepped inside. Picking up a baseball bat that was lying at the entrance, he walked bossily through the house and shouted violently. At his screams, a blonde-haired young woman ran out. As soon as she approached him, he struck her on the head with the bat, the woman fell unconscious, and instantly a pool of blood formed on the floor around her. 
The enraged, dark-haired man continued to strike the immobilized woman until his fervor subsided. It is hard to imagine, but it happens that in such a paradisiacal place of the planet as New Zealand can happen such bloody tragedies. After all, New Zealand is first of all a picturesque nature with its unique flora and fauna, which creates a comfortable climate for people to live in. People living here have a high standard of living with a measured and calm way of life, where there is no corruption and crime is close to zero, but today our story will disrupt the tranquil life of Oakland and completely change the notion of a happy family. Carmen and Brad met on an ordinary day, which later became a fateful day for the two of them. Carmen Thomas was born on October 30th, 1987 in South Africa. Her father died when the girl was only 10 years old. Heavily bearing the loss, her family moved to relatives in the town of Whitby in the United Kingdom. But in another country, the long-awaited peace never came, and after a while, her family moved back to South Africa. Carmen, who was over 18 years old at the time, decided to stay with her relatives and later moved to live in London. In London, Carmen completed her studies and earned a master's degree in marketing. She had a strong and mischievous personality that attracted people. Carmen was a loyal friend and comrade for many people, but a beautiful life in a large metropolis required a lot of expenses, and the girl had to work hard to ensure a decent standard of living. During the day, Carmen worked in the store as a marketer, and in her spare time, she worked part-time in a gentleman's club. Despite her strange choice in the service industry, Carmen was a girl of strict rules and never allowed herself unnecessary and even more so undignified behavior, which was very much appreciated by important clients. It was there that she met an attractive and flamboyant man, Brad Callahan. Bradford James Joseph Callahan was born in New Zealand in April 1978. The boy's parents separated when he was nine years old. Little Brad stayed with his mother, after which they moved to Australia. In 2001, Brad graduated from university and received an engineering degree in the construction industry. At the invitation of a large construction company, he moved to the UK, where he was offered a position as chief structural engineer for a large business complex. For important negotiations and added status, Brad turned to a gentleman's agency, and his choice fell on the beautiful Carmen. The man was intelligent, tall, black-haired, with bright dark eyes, but he could not afford a real relationship because of too much ambition and busy career. He had no free time for a permanent relationship. After a successful business dinner, Brad was conquered by the open and radiant Carmen. They continued informal communication, which was repeated again and again. After a while, they formed a good friendship, which later grew into love. The candy bouquet period flew by very quickly, and the lovers began to live together. Their life together was based on trust and care. They sincerely supported each other and looked absolutely happy. After a while, Carmen became pregnant, and Brad decided that the best solution for them would be to return to New Zealand, to a country with clean air and the measured course of life. They returned to Auckland. In March 2005, Carmen and Brad had their son Jack. Jack brought more joy and happiness into their lives. From the first days, Carmen and Brad took care of his safety and provided everything they needed for his happy childhood. To them, Jack was the most important thing in their lives. However, with the birth of their son, serious disagreements arose in their relationship. The first misunderstandings appeared because of the upbringing of the child. The relationship between the lovers became turbulent and unstable, and after three years they parted, but retained joint custody of the child. The breakup was difficult for both of them, but they sincerely tried to keep a good relationship for the sake of little Jack. Wanting support and wanting to be surrounded by family, Carmen and Jack moved in with Colin, Carmen's half-brother, who also lived in Oakland. Gradually, emotional balance returned to Carmen, and she began a new life without Brad. In 2008, Carmen moved with her young son to a house on a neighboring street to Brad's so that the son would be closer to his father. The young woman, who lost her father at an early age, 
sincerely wished that her child would always have a father around as much as she could. Despite this decision, many of Carmen's friends and family thought the couple still had a good friendship, but they only spent time together for Jack's interests. However, life went on. Carmen and Brad tried to find happiness separately again. Brad continued to work as a construction engineer, and in May 2009 he started a new relationship with a girl and even got engaged. Carmen was busy raising her son and resumed her services in the gentleman's club, which quite hurt Brad. He sincerely believed that the mother of his child should never again be interested in dubious earnings. This disagreement became a boiling point in their good relationship. With each passing day, the situation grew more heated. Carmen gave ultimatums to Brad, and he in turn simply ignored the requests of the former lover. Nevertheless, Brad entered into a new marriage and was preparing to become a father again. New financial obligations directly reflected on the alimony, which he paid under the agreement Carmen for the maintenance of Jack. The money was the last straw in a series of scandals. On March 19, 2010, neighbors called the police. The police officers arrived and responded to an incident of domestic violence. Harmon attacked Brad during another quarrel and received a warning. The relationship finally deteriorated. Arguments did not stop even at a distance. Each new question regarding Jack was perceived by each party in the bayonet and with aggression. Once loving parents for a long time could not agree on what school Jack should go to, and it again led to a number of unsolvable problems and a chain of scandals. On June 29, 2010, Radigam came to Carmen's house to make a new written agreement to pay child support and to discuss a new school for Jack. Carmen was not satisfied with the document, and she kicked Brad out of the house, yelling in the wake that Jack was not his son. Brad left. Two weeks later, Brad tried to speak to Carmen again, but she did not make contact. On July 13, 2010, he reported Carmen Tarmas missing to the police. The police took the report and began searching for the missing woman from video camera images and interviews with neighbors. Reconstructing the chronology of events since the last communication between Carmen and Brad, Investigators found out some important details that should help in the search for the woman. They managed to find out that on June 29th, a surveillance camera recorded Carmen at a supermarket near her home. While inspecting the rented house where Carmen lived with Jack, the lack of a garbage can on the outside caught the attention of police. Inside the house, there were also traces of blood on the front door, on the washing machine, near the sink and shower. Forensic scientists used luminol to detect traces of blood left at the crime scene because it reacts with the iron contained in blood hemoglobin. The multiple patterns that appeared confirmed the presence of blood on the bathroom door and on the floor. The landlady told investigators that on June 29th she heard loud screaming followed by prolonged crying and moaning. Recalling that day, she said she knocked on Carmen's door but no one answered. She had to look out the window. She saw a street trash can and an overturned fabric horse, which is a drying rack usually made of wood or metal for drying clothes. Startled, the landlady called her husband, but while she waited for him to arrive, Brad walked out of Carmen's house and into the driveway. He was carrying soiled clothes in his hands, and upon seeing the landlady, Brad rushed to explain that Carmen had become ill after a medical procedure and had vomited blood. However, the landlady noticed Brad's condition. He looked like he had just taken a shower. The woman had no reason to disbelieve the man's story and did not call the police. The search continued and Carmen's cell phone caught the attention of the police. Messages were being sent from her phone on a regular basis, but the manner of communication and tone of the messages were different and did not resemble Carmen's previous manner of communication. The outgoing messages and calls continued until July 10th. Where did the woman go if she needed medical help and why? The investigators did not have to look for answers to these questions for long. During further investigation, Harmon's car was found. In the back seat of the car was found luggage, 
clothes, and other belongings of the woman. The examination of the seized suitcase on some of the things were found traces of blood. A note was also found in the car indicating that Carmen owed money to the agency where she worked. In the glove compartment was an envelope with Misty's name on it and the sum of $270. Police Inspector Mark Benefield, after finding traces of blood in Carmen's car, first raised the possibility that the woman had been murdered. Police searched the countryside southeast of downtown Auckland for the body of Carmen Thomas after a new report that her car was spotted around the time she went missing, but the search was inconclusive. The investigation and search for the woman continued. When investigators examined Carmen's and Brad's phones at the same time, they discovered both phones had been nearby the entire time they were being searched, and Carmen's phone was not connected to a cell tower in Hamilton. Going forward, one of the most important pieces of evidence was the missing trash can. It remained to be seen if it could be the same bin that had disappeared from its place near the house, and that a neighbor had through her window on the day Carmen disappeared. But what did the trash can need to be inside the house for? The police did not refute the idea of the worst possible outcome and reach at Brad's cell phone and spending by examining his bank card details and traced his shopping list. On June 30th, Brad Callahan, a meat cleaver and a large plastic container, as well as several garbage bags. By scrutinizing Brad's daily routine, police identified some exceptional events but did not fit into the young father's daily to-do list. It turned out that on one workday, Brad arrived at the construction site very early and walked alone around the property for a long time. It was strange, but not so strange that the workers who saw him would start reporting anyone about such an early presence of a supervisor at the construction site. Based on the evidence gathered, such as Carmen's cell phone and questionable purchases, Brad went from victim to suspect. Police believed that Brad Callahan killed his former lover by hitting her several times in the head and carefully hiding the body. On September 21st, Brad Callahan was arrested on charges of murdering Carmen Thomas and attempting to change the course of justice. He pleaded not guilty and is scheduled to stand trial. In a fateful coincidence, Brad's second son from a new lover was born at the time of his incarceration which caused a wave of emotion and resentment in the young father who was in custody. The man broke down, and nine days after his arrest, he pointed out to investigators the burial place of Carmen Thomas. Rad thought he had come up with the perfect plan, part of which was to make it appear that Carmen had gone to Hamilton and never returned. He was absolutely certain he had succeeded, but life made adjustments. Under questioning, he detailed the chain of events from that fateful day. After a bad conversation, Carmen kicked Brad out of the house, yelling in the wake that Jack was not his son. Brad left, but five minutes later, he came back into the house and hit Carmen in the head with a baseball bat with such force that she immediately fell unconscious. Blood spurted from her wound, staining the floor a bright red. Heavy breathing filled the room, and Brad stood over the body of his victim with a wild scowl in his eyes. He realized he had just done the irreparable, but he couldn't stop. In a fit of anger and resentment at Carmen's words, he threw several punches again. He knew that his act carried irreparable consequences, but everything remained in the shadow of his insane obsession. Memories flashed before Brad's eyes, happy and endless memories that were now gone forever. Brad knew that his life would be forever changed after that disastrous moment, and that he would not be able to get back everything that was, but it did not upset him at all, because by such an act he had solved his main problem, and Jack was now only his. Having come to his senses, Brad took a shower and then quietly left Carmen's house. In the days that followed, he sprang into action to get rid of Carmen's body and cover up the crime. Callahan called his friend and arranged to meet him outside the supermarket. He asked him to buy three black garbage bags, 
a bottle of kerosene and cleaning products, and waited for him outside the store, hoping to avoid suspicion. Brad then went back into the apartment and cleaned it up. He carefully wiped up the blood spatter and then wrapped the body in a bag and took it out in a trash can. In the following days, the defendant dismembered Carmen's body into eight pieces to prepare it for disposal. He cut Carmen's legs from her torso at the hip joints. Each leg was cut through the knee into two pieces. Her arms and head were also severed from her torso. On July 3rd, he met a good friend at a boat ramp in Okahu Bay, near downtown Oakland. He told him that he had killed Carmen during an argument and needed help disposing of the body, but an attempt to dump the remains into the sea failed due to the friend's refusal to provide a boat. Over the next few days, he drove to Waitakere Ridge in West Auckland and buried the containers in a shallow grave. On July 7th, he drove Carmen's car to Hamilton and abandoned it in a hotel parking lot. He put a suitcase of clothes and several other bags of her personal belongings in the car to give the impression that the woman wanted to leave. But in his haste, he overlooked the fact that the suitcase also contained bloody clothes. After getting rid of the car, Brad began sending text messages from her cell phone to give the impression that Carmen was still alive. The criminal texted her friends, saying she wasn't feeling well and had been in bad shape for days. But Brad's perfect plan backfired on him. On October 1st, police went to the burial site Brad had indicated and discovered the body. Harmon Thomas's remains were found in plastic containers. They were carefully removed from a makeshift grave on Waitakere Ridge. An autopsy determined that Carmen Thomas had died from multiple blows to the head, with the fatal blow causing a compressed skull fracture. After multiple forensic examinations, Carmen's body was released to her family for burial. On October 13th, a private funeral was held at Green Lane Christian Center for Carmen Thomas, a young mother, a cheerful, kind, and successful woman. Little Jack, who all along had waited and hoped to see and hug his mom, was only able to hug and kiss her white casket. On February 8, 2011, the first court hearing for Carmen Thomas took place. Judge Wenning found the crime committed was unintentional and took into account Brad's explanation that he acted on emotion. He acknowledged that it was done in a fit of rage, but Judge Wenning was less lenient when it came to the cover-up. On May 26, 2011, Brad Callahan was newly charged with attempting to change the course of justice. A summary of the police case shows that at 8.45 a.m. on July 29, 2010, Callahan struck Mrs. Thomas several times in the head, resulting in her death. He then texted a friend to bring three garbage bags and a bottle of kerosene. During the ensuing period, Callahan dismembered Miss Thomas's body into eight pieces to prepare it for disposal. On November 25, 2011, a retrial was held. Police officers who had been working on the case filled the high court in Auckland when Bradford Callahan unexpectedly made two guilty pleas. Brad Callahan, who had previously denied guilt, suddenly admitted to murder and attempting to change the course of justice after Carmen's death. The judge said it was one of the most serious cases of attempting to pervert the course of justice, calling Brad's actions just about the most serious case of attempted perversion of justice there can be. The judge also felt the murder of Carmen Thomas was brutal, but not so brutal as to result in the harshest sentencing laws. The 33-year-old man was sentenced in Auckland High Court, where a large public gallery was filled with Thomas's friends and family, including her parents, who were visiting from South Africa. Judge Venning sentenced Brad Cowathan to life imprisonment for murder and six years in prison for attempting to pervert the course of justice. He also condemned the lengths Cowaghan went to in order to cover his tracks. The sentences are to be served concurrently. Judge Venning also said the minimum sentence for the perverting the course of justice charge was insufficient to bring Brad Callahan to justice. Mr. Callahan passed judgment on himself by his actions that day, and it had a devastating effect on two families, said Detective Inspector Mark Benefield. Callahan's supporters left court without comment. In a statement, the Thomas family said nothing can bring their Carmen back 
and they are still angry because of it. But they are grateful that Brad will be away for an extended period of time so he can reflect on the enormous damage he caused to their own son in the first place. Carmen Thomas's mother, Teresa Scott, told the court in a victim impact statement that she felt completely destroyed by what happened to her daughter. After the verdict was announced, the officer in charge of the investigation, Detective Inspector Mark Benefield, told the court that the justice done is the result of hundreds of hours of police work over the past 10 weeks since Carmen Thomas was reported missing on July 13, 2010. Also, Detective Mark Benefield, during the interview, explained what the work to find Carmen consisted of. He explained that early on in the missing person investigation, they determined that Carmen was most likely murdered. Then the work of gathering evidence, as well as researching information, was carefully conducted. This required a great deal of time and effort to gather, and it was also necessary that proper legal procedures were followed. The detective reported that over the last few weeks, close cooperation with the defendant's employer had not been finalized. Attempts to further investigate part of the Victoria Street construction site would continue in order to find any evidence that might assist the investigation. Until today, we have been unable to comment on media reports about our activities at the facility because we have been very sensitive to the issues of litigation and preemptive contempt of court, said Mark Benefield. He did not rule out the possibility of further arrests and charges in connection with Carmen's death in the near future. Brad Callahan had the courage to take responsibility for his actions in this tragic saga, and he pleaded guilty to two charges. But that will in no way change what he did. For the hearts of Carmen's loved ones are broken, their world shattered. Living each new day without Carmen, each of her close family members feels completely destroyed. We will never forgive him for what he did to our family, said Carmen Thomas's mother, Teresa Scott. I could forgive someone for taking a life under certain circumstances, but I can never forgive this man for being able to strip a body and hide it in containers, added her stepfather Wayne. Callahan's attorney Stuart Greave said his client acted responsibly and does not intend to file a motion. Can a sentence with parole eligibility after 13 years and 8 months be called a ridiculous miscarriage of justice? Obviously, since New Zealand only records about 50 murders a year for the entire country, any crime that is a little out of the ordinary is covered extensively by the national media, as are the court cases for those crimes. It's possible that there was an overbearing bias against the victim at trial because of her line of work. But even if Carmen was antagonistic and pissed Brad off, we don't blame the victim for having her life taken from her, do we? If Brad had wanted sole custody of his son, he likely would have used this prejudice about Carmen's work and gotten his way because he had the opportunity. Instead, he beat her to death and tried to cover it up. In this situation, we are not diagnosing. We are only speculating. In summarizing this gruesome story, the same question comes up repeatedly. It is understandable that in a fit of rage and uncontrollable anger, a person can commit irreparable acts. But what feelings can a healthy person have when he comes up with a plan to dismember a once tenderly loved person? Little Jack Callahan is currently living in another town under an assumed name in the temporary care of his grandmother. He doesn't know that his daddy took his mom's life and must never find out because it wasn't his fault. Absurd.